I mean, let's kick off with a little bit of theory, uh, I think, yes. with uh, our pal uh, James Lindsay, the Marx uh, understander. I mean, mm-hmm. second, I mean, you got people like David Harvey. I mean, a lot, lots of folks who you know explicate the works of Karl Marx. Uh, mm-hmm. And we have another. Uh, everybody's getting in on it. Uh, the Glenn Beck program is even interested in you know, communism and. Well, here's James, and uh, I. This really blew my a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, you're the theory guy on the show, David. Um, I didn't. I feel like you're kind of holding out on me because some of this stuff, I, I wish somebody had brought to my attention earlier. This is very powerful stuff. Let's go. How did they do this? Well, Mao did his thing. The CCP runs China into a disaster. A couple of leaders later, you have Deng Xiaoping working with Kissinger and so on, and they open up the markets of China. But it's all at the pleasure. I just want to say I respect Glenn Beck's wardrobe. Um, the um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm blanking on the term for that, but mine I, I had a similar uh, uh, article that uh, has oh, been like run the over sto- the stoner hoodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's uh, there's a name for. Th- I, I'm oh, really yeah. yeah I'm well, I mean, it's a pon- the poncho is like the general term, but is there a brand? I've had like a, yeah. Oh, well, like I've heard, yeah, like people call him the. I uh, love that, like, director. Glenn Beck, like Donald Trump gets elected and, you know, Glenn Beck in the right wing media, you know, scene gets rightfully way too late, by the way. I mean, this guy's on CNN for years, called out for being like extremely racist and reactionary. And Glenn Beck's like pivot from there is no real change in the content or anything like that. But he just starts, you know, he got a fedora. And some interesting rim glasses, and now he's wearing a poncho. Like he, did, like he just started dressing like a hipster, um, yeah. and then <laughs> kept everything exactly the same. You know, yeah. What's funny about uh, Glenn Beck is he changes his set so often, mm. and just by being in the same business, to me, that's like, oh, you're getting giant shit to write off on your taxes every year. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this, like, this dude. <laughs> This dude made a replica fucking White House, and he used it for like nine months. Like, and and then he did this like, uh, Glenn, did you ever see the Glenn Beck TMZ? Um, when he, it was like, you know, that TMZ style of sitting around the newsroom and everyone spitballing uh, oh, uh, ideas for articles around their cubicles. Um, well, we don't have time to get into, it, but they tried that. Like, and it's, I, I don't know. Um, Anyway, here's Glenn Beck in a new studio. Uh, with this one with just a you know an antique table, just very strange optics. It's like the background is at the like heights of a stadium lighting or something like that. Um, anyway, here's a little bit more. Open up the markets of China, but it's all at the pleasure of the party. It's all state capitalism, which is by definition fascism. So what do you have there? You have a communism with fascism inside of it, communo fascism. So what is the dialectical opposite of communo fascism? It's a- I just want to take this nice and slow because this person did speed up this video a little bit, it looks like. Unless it's just how fast this guy operates. It's all state I mean, capitalism, it which is by definition <laughs> fascism. So what do you have there? You have a communism with fascism inside of it. Communo-fascism. So what is the dialectical <laughs> opposite of communo-fascism? It's a fascism with communism inside of it. Fascio-communism. So you have East Asia. We just don't have Oceania to always be at war. But wait, what's inside Asia of East Asia? Yet. So if you make China into this behemoth, a communism with fascism running inside of it so that it solves a production problem of Soviet disaster of communism because it has now an open market that's running state capitalism, but still very wealth generating market. Mm-hmm. And then you can create the opposite of that in the West. If you can create a fascist oligarchy that decides to, sure, the, the people in the top are going to be the lords and ladies of the new aristocracy, and we are all going to be the serfs, mind for our data and our pod while we enjoy our mealworms and crickets. But It'll be equitable. So if you take that fascist structure and stick a communism inside of it, and then those are the two world powers, not exactly enemies, but frenemies, mm-hmm. a communism with fascism. Wait, inside no, to a fa- stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. I've watched this a couple times, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll break down some of it because I know this will trickle into some parts of the internet where people will accuse us of not taking James Lindsay's brilliant point seriously. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that in a second. But I did not hear him use the dialectical term, not enemies, but frenemies. I mean, this is like some, come on, y'all. This is some last minute, you have a presentation for school stuff. If you're trying to apply concepts like dialectical materialism, 
not enemies, but fren frenemies. I mean, Lord in heaven, help us all. I I want to try to find that still of Glenn Beck. Um, Looking forward. You know what's funny yeah. about Glenn Beck's outfit and all this stuff too? Is that like, you know, like some like liberals and like leftists are like, well, all we need is to like continue doing the exact same thing that we've been doing. But if we just take on the aesthetics of, you know, the right, we'll win. Right. So if we had like, you know, left politicians who dress maybe more like you would think a stereotypical, like, you know, uh, working class conservative dresses, like we would win. Glenn Beck does that like on the opposite side, like Glenn Beck's like, I'm going to continue doing the same super right wing reactionary stuff, but I'm going to look like the sweetest guy at like your <laughs> local library yeah. book drive, you know? <laughs> yes. Because that, that is like, he's, um he's like a reader's like reading dad, right? Like Glenn Beck <laughs> is like, yeah, you, you got a dad who likes to read about patriotism. Like Glenn Beck has been going for that market for a long time. And trust me, I've seen, I've been in houses of people's dads who are, are have just stacks of his shit. Um, but, uh, you know, I also wonder like if he, is he lose is Lindsay losing him here? Because I think he, I think he analysis, lost him almost immediately. Well, like the analysis quickly comes back to domestically. It seems like, unless I'm, I'm getting mm -hmm. uh, upside down, but it seems like he's talking about how we have a sort of fascial communism here. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, I, I don't think like, First of all, the Orwellian term would be oligarchic collectivism. Uh, just to uh, uh, that's what he, the theory of and practice of oligarchical collectivism is the, the, the subversive text in 1984. But anyway, um, like I, I, I'm trying to understand like what is Lindsay's actual critique of society here, and it's like the tech companies moderating people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like um, anyway, you see, and we are. Not are going to be the but only because it can be coded as left right in the sense of right. like you know socially liberal um because it's not the oil companies for example yeah that are exactly <laughs> the, the, or the, the banks. fascism in the country it's like oh it's apple right yeah or and real estate they're, it, they're soft right they're honestly soft what's words. the like the fucking if you want to look at a fucker or a fucking conspiracy in every single community it's real estate it's basically open about it right like that's true um, yeah anyway Surf's mind for our data and our pod while we enjoy our mealworm. Now that Surf's mind for our data and our pod, that's very, remember that we talked to Ed on Gueso about that Zuboff book of mm. the era of surveillance capitalism and how that was actually just kind of like a secret way of saying, well, capitalism's good, except for all these people doing all this like surveillance style stuff. Right. So what James Lindsay is doing here is apologizing for capitalism in the guise of critiquing capitalism. Uh, a la Shasan and Zupa. Well, very wealth generating market. Mm -hmm. And then you can Very create the generated. opposite of that in the West. If you can create a fascist oligarchy that decides to, uh, sure, the, the people in the top are going to be the lords and ladies of the new aristocracy, and we are all going to be the serfs, mined for our data and our pod while we enjoy our mealworms and crickets. But it'll be... Can we just talk about, like, that? Um, what would, a, like, a Marxist say to that? Like, what the ruling class is interested in the people, like, their data... Like, mm -hmm. no, this is about like the fundamentally what the ruling class is interested in is coercing your labor. And they do it for <laughs> things like they do it for things like uh, stopping eviction moratoria during a pandemic. Uh, they mm. do things like give corporations thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for the thousands of dollars you might get for relief during that pandemic. Right. Like all of this is geared towards that. It, it Like your fucking data, bro. That's just so that's just like for people to sell you ads. <laughs> like it's like that. The data stuff, I, I got to say that it, it really is like um, I don't I, it's I mean, such like the data stuff is like, you know, there's a critique to be made of like what they're what they're mining from all of us. But as you're saying, like the point, <clears throat> it doesn't end at the data, right? Yeah. They want the data because they want, um, you know, because, they, again, they want to sell you things. And two, the ruling class wants to coerce you into using your labor power for their benefit. Right. Like, right. yeah, at the end of the day, it's not like. <laughs> to get the highest price grasping, from you. Too. I mean, he's grasping at like, that's the thing is like, you know, like. What you know, what you have to realize when you watch people like James Lindsay, especially because he's like he's making a career out of doing this. It's critiquing, or it's not critiquing. 
it's pointing out like the alienation and the worry that you are rightfully feeling about society and that like things are, um, you know, trending into a, a direction of austerity and of this kind of like techno dystopia. Right. But notice very, very clearly with Lindsay that there is never a fundamental critique of the thing that you spend the vast majority of your time doing, which is working. Right. Like Lindsay always dances around that. So he points to some things that might make us uncomfortable and like it's right to feel uncomfortable about those things. Um, but he does that so that he can avoid ever talking about the fundamental contradiction, the fundamental factor um, in, in, in class struggle. And that is the uneven distribution of the proceeds of the work and labor that the vast majority of us are doing. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, I'm trying to find. Uh, there's a few people that when uh, Lindsay goes on his George Orwell shit, that point out that Orwell himself was a democratic socialist to the end. Um, mm -hmm. And Lindsay says uh, um, that uh, basically like, well, okay, Orwell is just wrong. Democratic socialism doesn't exist, right? So that's the extent to which he's um, uh, brilliant. That. Yeah. But, but was it fascist? Um, how does he fascist say fascist? Fascist communism. communism, fascist and communism. Fascist. That's a new... This term he just came up with is is a hundred percent real and true. Let's keep going because <laughs> we need to be educated, Matt. I do love these stills we're getting from these guys. I mean, he's a very normal so looking guy. Yeah, I mean, this is a mathematician doing. <laughs> it's a, no offense to mathematicians. I don't know why I said that. Uh, it just bothers me because he like speaking of Marcus from Left Left Flank Vets, uh, James like got into him and like tried to get him. Like, I don't know severely like uh, punished for saying something about communism um and he's a fucking nerd anyway pod while we enjoy our mealworms and crickets but it'll be equitable so if you take that fascist structure and stick a communism inside of it and then those are the two world powers not exactly enemies but frenemies mm -hmm. a communism with fascism inside <laughs> next to a fascism with communism inside and you let those things run next to each other the natural process of the dialectic will eventually fuse all of it and what you'll end up with is the kingdom you'll end up with communism that works this time and i think that that's the program and so they are definitely using the race marxists <laughs> because the marxists are extraordinarily Sorry. destabilizing but let's get that reaction shot from glenn beck just glenn beck time. yeah he just he had a personal experience <laughs> just then <laughs> so that i'll say <laughs> that's the program and so they are definitely <laughs> using the race Marxists because the Marxists are extraordinarily destabilizing. But the people who are funding this, the people who are dumping millions upon millions of dollars, billions of dollars into critical race theory to drag it out of the university where it should have. Wait, to drag it out of, oh wait, drag it in, into billions of dollars. In critical billions race of dollars theory. to drag it out of the university. I think he means into. Well, I think he's out of the university and into your school. I think we'll let's, uh, let's let him go a little bit further. But kingdom, you'll end up with communism that works this time, and I think that that's the program. And so they are definitely using the race Marxists because the Marxists are extraordinarily destabilizing. But the people who are funding this, the people who are dumping millions upon millions of dollars, billions of dollars into critical race theory to drag it out of the university where it should have just kind of languished because it's stupid. It got funded out of the university. That's how it didn't spontaneously get out of the university. Bags and bags and bags of cash got dumped into fueling these movements, especially around the Occupy Wall Street time Good to protect the banks. And so the fascist <laughs> with the communist inside was born. And th that's the objective. And they because they, they, this is their magic. It's their faith. They believe that if you put those two opposites Ooh. next to each other and they're the only two opposites that eventually the dialectical process will average it all out, but raise it up to a higher level. The Marxist word for that is sublate. The German word is Aufheben which is the word that, that Hegel and Marx use over and over. I think uh, uh, Sam Holdley Brill, who we've had on this program before, is right to point out uh, there's anti-Semitism, I think, underneath that. Uh, that this is their magic, their faith, um, billions of dollars going to fund CRT. Uh, That's, hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, 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 mean I, I don't doubt it in the sense of like... <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's it's pretty classic, you know, old school reactionary right wing stuff to talk about some kind of Jewish conspiracy that's behind both the communist, apparently somehow on, on both sides, like both the communist movement and the bourgeois movement. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a there's a historical parallel there, but 
can I just say just really quick before we get too far ahead of anything um, that and and Lord, please help us all. Please help us all. But for anyone who's watching this and might think that this guy is making a lick of sense. Let me please help you out here. Dialectics is not when you just smash concepts together. Right? <laughs> it's not just when you take one word and another word and then you smash them together and and, and, and something new comes out of it. Rather, it's, it's a very, very interesting and important way to thinking about concepts and society that is in motion, right? Um, and I, I just don't have the patience right now, um, you know, to, to go through all of the, the, the history of, of Marx and, and, and his tension with Hegel that, uh, that, that James is, is really skipping over there. But very, very funny to talk about sublimation um, in, in as, as something that like is, is a, a fixture of Marx's work. Um, cause Marx actually very rarely uses these kinds of terms, very, actually very rarely even uses the terms, uh, dialectic, um, because Marx broke from Hegel, who was an idealist, but let's just go to dialectical materialism and like why these concepts, why people use them and why it's not the stupid thing that James is doing. Right. <laughs> so to give you like a moving example. Right. Dialectics is understanding that inside of a whole, there are different components. Right. And those components can have tensions with one another. The most classic and useful example of that is, is capitalism. Right. Capitalism is a class system. Right. And then what that means is that capitalism produces different classes. The two dominant classes in capitalism are the proletariat, working people and the bourgeoisie, rich people and your boss. Right. And the bourgeoisie produces the proletariat. Because they enclose upon the commons, right? They basically make it so that you cannot subsist or survive in society without selling your labor, right? And that process then turns people, right, who could have been serfs or farmers or even some of them petty artisans or things like that, into workers, proletarians. Um, so to for for capitalists, for the bourgeoisie to basically be able to like create this system to create their own wealth, they create, um, you know, the, the proletarian. Right, the proletariat, and both of those classes together created an entire system that we call capitalism. The dialectical process in it that Marx is talking about um, or, or working through is this process that because these two classes have opposite interests, right? Because the the bosses, the the bourgeoisie, the pro, the um, you know, the bosses, rich people, the ruling class in society, they want to be able to exploit working people as much as possible because that puts more money in their pocket, right? Working people want to work less and they want to make more money. So there's a conflict um, that's going on between these two classes. The dialectical process, or at least the, the hope of, of socialism, and it's not a given, it's not a promise, it's a, it's a potential, right? And that's the other really important thing is these things aren't determinist necessarily, but they just sort of chart out different ways that society could go. The hope or the idea of socialism is that for the, the proletariat to eradicate its condition, its, its miserable condition as the exploited class in society, it has to eradicate not only their, their opponent in, in, in the bourgeoisie, but the entire class system itself, right? Which makes them a radical class unlike any other class in, in history, right? But that's dialectics on like a, on a historical societal level. And it's not only limited to those kind of things, but it's recognizing that within a concept, within a structure, there are multiple components that are contradictory to each other. And instead of seeing things as only one thing or another, understanding that these there's that there is complexity and there is our dynamics and there's movements within systems and within ideas and within concepts, right? That's dialectics. It's not just some dumbass smashing together of, uh, you know, of, of concepts. I also want to really correct this one right quick because um, earlier in the clip too, um, <clears throat> James says something that uh, his type and his ilk do a lot that is extremely unhelpful, Right. Um, and it's purposefully unhelpful is when they call fascism like state capitalism. Right. Yeah. Um, and what they because um, that is not what fascism is. Right. Fascism is not by definition state capitalism. Fascism is a right wing. And you can even drop that if you get worked up about that concept. Right. It is a national nationalist movement that requires sacrifice of the collective to the nation. 
right? You put the nation above all. It's anti-democratic, race-based, and militaristic, right? And you want to talk about dialectics, right? Um, again, it's not just smashing together different concepts. Understand that fascism as a historical force, right, as a historical movement has always been born out of what system? Capitalism. Why? Because the ruling class in Germany and in Italy and in Japan, when faced with radical left wing working class movements, right, that were challenging the power of, of, of the bourgeoisie, they resorted to anti-democratic measures to smash the power of organized labor, of organized working class movements, right? You know, this kind of idea that like, you know, socialism and like fascism are somehow, you know, connected or, you know, two sides of a similar coin um, is absurd when you look at the fact that one of the first things that you see under fascist regimes is the smashing or the complete co-option of union movements and organized labor, right? Um, fascism is not some kind of state capitalism. Fascism is the, the ruling class of the bourgeoisie incorporating a nationalist ideology to supplant any other kind of class solidarity or any other kind of understanding that people have and encourage people who are workers not to see themselves as oppressed workers, but of members of a proud nation, right? And yeah, you know, it might be tough work for you, but know that your blood, sweat, and tears is pushing the race forward, right? Like that's what fascism is. And this kind of idea that like, oh, well, state-run industries are, are, are fascism is absolutely a historical absurd. Um, and for fuck's sake, it's not a dialectical concept by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like Robert Paxton, who uh, writes about fascism, Anatomy of Fascism is the book. And he's not, it's not like, a, I think he's just like a liberal historian. So he's not coming mm -hmm. at this from like a Marxist lens, but no, no. he even emphasizes like the ca the uh, communist threat. It's off, like fascism is often like a state response, a fa like a capitalist state response to a communist threat. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I know. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, like. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail because I know it's a funny clip, but like I get frustrated at, at, at people sometimes see um, us when we do any kind of laughing at, at Lindsay. It's like, oh, well, you're not engaging with his arguments. Like the point is, his arguments are just so fucking absurd. Um, yeah, he's filling time on on fucking. He's shows. saying frenemies. He's talking about like, well, <laughs> yeah. they're not just enemies; they're frenemies, right? Like this is not a serious thinker. Um, yeah. <laughs> Lord in heaven, and please. I will say this: if somebody thinks that. Uh, he is a serious thinker. I will even go further. His whole like original uh, hoax with the paper stuff is fraudulent. It doesn't. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. purport, it doesn't say nearly what he thinks it says or acts like it says. Uh, that I can give you. Come to me on Twitter if you want some uh, references on that. But David, are you sure this isn't uh, dialectics? <laughs> Okay, we've already got one. I'm uh, into it. <laughs> dialectics. I loved all the dialectics that were going on in the mid 2000s and uh, late 2000s. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Gray album with uh, Danger Mouse. Or I forget who that was. So I, I don't remember the details. But yeah. Man, I mean, sorry, you can just get me so worked up. Like, I mean, like, again, drop all of this stupid ass shit that he's saying, right? Remember that, like, in James's, like, cosmology, right? And I'm going to call it that because it's something from out of this fucking world. Um, how, how he sees, you know, the, the, the history of, of the past hundred years. Um, you know, there is a council, apparently. Right. You notice how like there's a, there's a plan, like some people are like in the, you know, after the after Mao's long march, they're like, you know what? We're going to have Mao destroy the country, um, you know, and, and the economy so that we can incorporate this this kind of state capitalism. Right. Like Mao was saying, like, we're doing this so that Deng Xiaoping um, you know, can, can rise up in a, in a couple generations to, uh, you know, to sh fundamentally shift the Chinese state, right? Like, I mean, absurd on its face, but also like going back to what you said at the very beginning, goes back to this very, very reactionary kind of conspiracy that there is a group, I won't say which group they're alluding is, is behind it, but there's some kind of secret group behind all of this stuff planning our downfall. 
And I'm sorry, if you re read any history of the far right and the nastiest movements, I mean, that is a key belief and a key factor uh, in, in all of their texts and arguments. Yep. And it is such a, it's such a, it's such a tell that they're planning our downfall and what are they going to do? They're going to know which websites we visited, <laughs> right? And they're like, going to make us no. eat bugs. Yeah, motherfucker, they're making you give up uh, a third of your fucking life, uh, half of your waking life More, to yeah. fucking serve profiteers. That's what they're doing. That's the fucking grand conspiracy, dickhead. Okay. I know. That's the thing that's so sad about all the, the kind of, right conspiracy theorists in general, but particularly right wing ones. It's like, you know, you don't need to tell stories about goblins or lizards or any of this shit. Like, it's your boss. Right, like yep. <laughs> you see them around you constantly. We can tell you who's ruining your life. Like they, yeah, there's certainly a plan, um, yeah. and it's and it's much less like nefarious and, and secret than than you're making it out to be. It's actually quite explicit and in your face. Yeah. Well, should we do some uh, voicemails? <laughs> that sounds like fun. Uh, we got one here. Uh, here. I need to get a better brain with this kind of thing. I like. I don't have the patience when we get comments on these things, you yeah. know, and someone's like, well, you didn't, you didn't like spend 45 minutes explaining why James Lindsay is wrong. But it's just like, because he's not saying anything legitimate. He's straight up ad libbing. Yeah. He, he like, he, he's like, I've learned some Hegel words and some Marx words and I'm just going to throw them around willy nilly. Yeah. And, it's, and the thing that sucks is it's like, it's one thing to <clears throat> that sort of conceptual play. Like, you know, Bill Simmons talking about like, uh, friends characters and who they are as mm. NBA players and that sort of stuff like is is engaging when the person knows what the fuck it is they're talking about yeah. but like Lindsay has tasked himself with all this homework and he digests it in this fucking embarrassing ass way because he needs shit to talk about on his Glenn Beck hits mm -hmm. and he throws a little spice in there with the secretive group putting into billions of dollars to spread like race hate. Like, you know, I don't know. It's, it, it doesn't require uh, a whole lot of uh, more care than that. Um, but uh, I, did he write a book recently? Maybe we should uh, take it. Yeah, yeah. We might have to, I hate to say it, but we might have to. Yeah, it's something Marxism, everyday Marxism. It's the, Ooh, Yeah. I don't think it's called Everyday Marxism. <laughs> what is it? It's something like that, though. It is something. I think like it's self-published too, which is so awesome. <laughs> hey, get that schmoney. 